We'll now hear reactions from Mark Perlman. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, first of all, for the honor of speaking with you today. Uh, it's not often that a technology guy, per se, gets the pleasure of speaking in front of such a esteemed group, so thank you very much. You know, my, my assignment today was to kind of react to what I've heard. And uh, first of all, I, I think the, the part that we've got to remember is it's not about the technology. It, it's about the fact that, you know, the web, you know, as Judy so eloquently described, is an enabler. It's an enabler. It's a transport mechanism. It's the highway. It's the highway that's going to connect our cities, our information, our healthcare system, the consumers who we really are talking about today. When we talk about aging, we talk about disability, we talk about independence, and then we try to tie that back into the web or uh, other things that are critical here that we're talking about. It's, it's about making that super highway be non-existent but be there every day. It's about the ability of going from Washington to Kansas City on a highway that has standards. We know what the lanes look like. We know how to drive on those highways. We know what the uh, characteristics must be. But it's also open. It's open where you know people can continue to take whatever type of car or vehicle they need to that meets their need, whether it be one that accommodates disabilities, whether it has hand controls, whether it be you know, a Ford super truck, whatever it may be, you know, the web is an open solution or a platform that really should give you that ability. So when you think about it, you know, ultimately, we're talking about today about consumers. We're talking about people that need to access the web, the people that need to access technology, and then what are we going to do with it? Because ultimately, it's the end result of what are we going to do with it, and I know that's the challenge which you all will be debating tomorrow. But I'd argue that the thing that we have to, first of all, is think about the folks that we're dealing with as consumers. And if you look back uh, at some work that's been done by the Deloitte uh, Health Institute, uh, Dr. Paul Keckley and others, they've been doing a longitudinal consumer study in healthcare for a number of years. And uh, they found out that people want access and they want to have resources available. To Clayton's point, it's got to be in a format that's usable and meets their needs. So let's make that assumptive they were going to develop things that way. The people who want to have that access are what they call the sick and savvy or the online and on board. And so we need to think about that. Second of all, uh, people want to have control of their health care information. 57% of the people want to be able to schedule office visits, connect with their doctor, exchange email. Further, people are very concerned about security on the web. Over 40% of the people consider themselves very concerned. So let's not take that lightly. As we develop standards, let's make sure that we incorporate meaningful standards, not barriers to entry that create too much. And so there is a trade-off between the 40% who are very concerned and the 60% that are somewhere less than that. So we've got to think about that balance. I'd also say that, you know, when we think about, you know, the Internet, the home, I was very uh, moved when we talked about the VA project where we have the homes in Colorado uh, that are enabled for disabled veterans. And you, you think about the fact that um, these homes are now smart homes. They can control their temperatures. They can control their, uh, the access, the lighting, the security, things we talked about. There's sensors. We have connected homes now. And connected homes are typically connected to guess what? The web, right? Uh, but a part of having a connected home starts giving us new capabilities and new opportunities to really do things that are, are, are quite interesting. First of all, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, aging, disability, and independence. Uh, many of us have parents who are getting older. So when we think about aging, don't think about it as a person necessarily who's aging. But think of yourself as a person who's going to have parents that you have to help monitor their care one day. And if their homes have sensors or they have RFID technology that says, are they moving around, are they making phone calls, are they chatting, whatever it is, you as a caregiver or as a, a child have the ability of really helping take care of your parent. Health care and care in general is moving outside of the four walls of a hospital to be a system without walls. A system without walls means that we have, need to have connectivity. And part of connectivity means that we have to be able to do something with that data and that information that is significantly meaningful. And when we think about what are the things that are also critical, it's access to, to care, it's access to information, it's the ability of having monitoring and self-care. And, you know, we, we, uh, Ms. Meadows was saying something about is it meaningful, and 
you know, how are we going to find things to be cost effective? Well, we've got a crisis. There aren't enough health care caregivers that are going to be ready for us in the next 10 years. The average doctor is 53 years old in this country. There's not enough medical students. There's not enough people out there that are going to take care of us. And guess what? The baby boomers are striking. And what that means is our wait times are going to go up, our access to care issues are different, and those who will be taking primary care of us when we get older are going to be different types of health professionals. So part of the burden of a healthcare technology company like Oracle is to help create systems and solutions to start getting into automated decisioning. To get into things that if you have a, or you're tracking a blood glucose monitor, or you're taking a look at uh, you know, the, you know, maybe a person that has uh, congestive heart failure in their weight scales, to be able to start saying there's criteria, there's barriers, there's gateways, there's things that will create alert, alerts, not only alerts, interventions, and making sure the right person is there, supporting your allied caregivers. You know, let's take a look at the fact that if somebody continues to gain weight or maybe they don't get on their weight scale, you know, depending on who they are and the personalization you want, you want, may want a clinician to call them, a social worker, or if they continue to trend up or have problems, you may want to intervene and even call an ambulance. These things can be done by technology, but you need a web, you need standards, you know, you need things that people will use because uh, if you're not going to use the monetary technology, you're not going to get on that weight scale that attached to the internet, who cares, right? So the future, you know, right now, I think is all about a, an experience, a customer experience. And, what that customer experience continues to get down to is providing a safety net, capabilities, the ability for self-care, the ability to get information in the personalized form that you want it, right place, right time, right fashion. Uh, it's also the ability of the, 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 the monitoring that we talked about and making it passive. And Clayton eloquently talked about what is big data. And uh, I think if you ask 15 people what big data is about, you may get 17 answers. Uh, but you really should think about it that everything we do and all the digital footprints we leave out there today can be mined for big data to create predictive analytics. Let's put it in a practical format. You know, big data is you're typically by, defined by McKinsey as three or more data sources being brought together to glean new information. Uh, I think it was on, on Black Friday, Macy's was even able to tell what their sales would be by 9.30 in the morning because of tracking cell phones, looking at the web hits, and a few other things. So that was predictive analytics. That was big data. But in healthcare, um, you know, structured data, you know, things that we, we, we know about, you know, emails, you know, and, and things that people are chatting about, the social networks, Twitter, Facebook, uh, the, the websites that you hit, you know, are you concerned about your particular health and things at this point, are all data sources that can be mined in a big data fashion. I'll put the hypothesis out there that when you think about the cloud, you look at the passive and the active and the structured and unstructured data, we have a very much of a, a opportunity to unbelievably change the way that care is given for those who are getting older, who are disabled, and those who want to remain independent. And I'll give one example as I'm running close on my time. We have a customer we're working with today. It's, it's a well-known fact that the returning veterans are having a problem with suicide, right? But it's also a well-known fact that there's you know, 10, 12 different factors that people can track to be as indicators of those who may be susceptible. How are we gonna monitor those, especially if somebody does have depression or whatever the, the situation may be? We're gonna monitor it through structured and unstructured data. We're gonna monitor it through interaction centers we're going to monitor it through the ability of connecting with somebody on the phone to say, how you doing? Or are you, in fact, moving around? Are you, whatever these things are, these disparate sources. And so the hope of big data is to be able to take information that is correlated that could be tracked back to these type of indicators that may be causing suicide and ultimately create an intervention. So I guess in conclusion, what I would say to you is, is my reaction is we have to have our standards. We have to have our ability of making it easy, not only easy for people to write great creative applications and solutions for the market, but the ability for people to access them and use them. If they're not used, they're not valuable. But then I think the hope for us is to think about how do we create products, solutions, opportunities, and projects 
It will transform the way that people live today so that people can live independent, irrespective of what their challenges, irrespective of what their opportunities may be. It doesn't really matter. We all are getting older, and we want fo the folks around us to get older. So we have to have the products and the solutions through technologies and enablers to make the difference. So with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, appreciate it.